outcome of the match and how long the match is, yeah. right? And I feel like that's something that in future years teams would have loved to have to <laughs> stop the match when they were ahead. But um, yeah, that really played well with this four versus zero dynamic. Yeah, Andy, Andy, you had been a mentor at, at this point for a couple of years now. Um, yep. And this was this was the first year where we had a new robot controller system, right? Yeah, I think this was the first year of the Innovation First robot controller, which which was uh, it was a very dependable um, robot controller system. Even though it was new, it had a, a few bugs in it, but it was super. It was a great improvement over the previous um, pretty much homegrown kits that you would have. You would, I think you would borrow the robot controller from first. You had to give it back at the end of the year. This year, during kickoff, they told us that we weren't going to be competing against the other teams on the field. Like there wasn't going to be two versus two or one versus one versus one. It was going to be four versus zero. And yet, and whatever points you would score, <clears throat> the other alliance had to beat your points in the next match. And for the most part, the majority of first teams didn't like that. They, they were like, oh, we want defense. We want action. We want bang and rope. But uh, this is what they did. So that's what they gave us. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the, those games where it's not, you know, alliance versus alliance definitely become controversial in, in uh, first. But they present a lot of unique opportunities for, you know, kind of a, a new look on what a robotics competition really can be. And, you know, this being one of the first ones um, is kind of, kind of impactful for me of like, Oh, that's weird. Like, yeah, you normally play two v two at that time, whatever. But um, definitely, definitely create some weird, interesting um, dynamics. The four versus zero, and um, a lot of opportunities for specialized robots on the field. Um, we we learned that there there were some matches that had um, kind of the perfect pairings of robots that could score really high. Andy, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, so first of all, the teams in the finals were auto-paired. So if you're the number one seed, you didn't, you didn't necessarily get first pick. You were automatically paired with the number five seed. So if, if you were a balancer and the number five seed was a balancer, you were, you were kind of shafted by the auto-pick. But if, if the alliances were, 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 were optimal, you would have a a robot that would place balls on top of the goals really well, the, the big ball on top of the goal, and you would have one robot that was really good at balancing and another robot that was good at, like, um, hauling one of the goals around the field. It During during qualification matches, you never got – you rarely, rarely got teams that were all unique in their, in their abilities for each one of those things. So – there were many, many arguments during the qualification matches because, you know, our team would want to balance. They'd say, hey, we're a really good balancer. We're, we want to balance. And then another team like, well, we want to balance too because we got to show what we can do in order to get picked in the finals. And my sponsors are here and our kids work hard at this. We, we got to be the balancer. So there was tons of arguments in the qualification matches, not only because of that, but also because – this was the last year that first didn't tell you which match you were going to be in during the qualification matches. They said you're going to be in the range of matches between match 22 and 25, somewhere in that range. That's your match. You would show up to the field. They put you in a corral. And then five minutes before the match would be queued for your match, they would say, okay, you four teams, you're in match 22. And then from then on, that's when you started negotiating your roles. It was a mess. So <laughs> there were a lot of arguments. But obviously in the finals, you you mostly got to pick your alliance. I think it was the I think it was world championships that the auto matching happened. But in the finals, if you were a balancer, you would need one or two big ball placers. So you would pick them and then you would pick a team that was like a tugboat team to pull the goal or put it in place. My team was in the really fortunate position of, of being against like the, the world high score twice the, the, the seven ten match that certain people on that alliance keep talking about to this day. Anyway, <laughs> so um, that happened. So the seven ten match happened, I think at the regional level, but it was almost like a, a perfect match that year was seven ten, And it was really neat to see, except you're the team trying to beat that match 
in the elimination rounds, it, in order to advance out of your bracket, you had to post a higher score than your opponent. The lower seed, I think, would go first. Then the higher seed would, would need to beat the lower seed score. Um, I think they had they had two chances. Each team that got two chances to do it. Maybe if the higher seeded team didn't beat the lower seeds team during the first round, they might not have had a second chance. I'm not sure about that. But it was much like 2015, um, Recycle Rutch, when everybody in the whole building was really rooting for you to, to not do well if, if you were a top seed. They all wanted you in your in your alliance to mess up so the lower seeds could be, much like 2015. Amanda, um, games that have maximum scores are, are pretty rare now uh, in the first robotics competition, right? And there's there's a couple strategies, right? There's either have unlimited game pieces or have so many game pieces that it's not reasonable for teams to score, right? Can you talk a little bit more about like the balance of like, if you're gonna have a maximum score possible, like how do you weigh, like if there's a finite number of game pieces, how do you weigh the the robot strength versus you know the number of game pieces in the field and how that iteration loop happens? Well, in game design, there's been so many games of different types that when we go down to like, we look at cycle times and you really have to consider um, you know, low end and high end and what that average cycle time is going to look like um, because you don't want, you know, your, your championship matches to end too early and robots are just spinning on the field, but you also want your lower end, um, you know, week one matches to look to actually have the game being played. So we actually um, at first do like walkthroughs as humans and act out the game and try to predict as best we can to get that balance. And it's all different depending on the game actions and robot mechanics that you want to see in your game. Yeah, that feels like one of the, like from an external perspective, it feels like it's got to be one of the hardest parts of game design of like hitting that balance perfect of this game is awesome week one all the way through Einstein, right? Like, and when you have it, it's really obvious, right? Like, like you look at Power Up, right? It was engaging all the way through the entire competition season. Stronghold was another one of those games, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the, that balance is so hard when you're also trying to come up with new, like new challenges at the same time that are like twists on, on things, right? So like, I have tons of respect um, for the folks at first who mm -hmm. do that really hard work that like teams are probably doing right now um, when they're watching this broadcast of trying to weigh that really hard problem of games that are good all the way through through the season. So 2001 being, you know, 4v0, the 10th anniversary, things were like kind of total turn on their head there. But um, 2002 was a little bit of turn to normalcy back again, where you had, you know, same still um, carpeted field, but it was back to 2v2, right, Andy? What, what was Zone Zeal all about? Zone Zeal was, again, two on two on a big field, big rectangular field. And the, the goals, there were three goals involved and each of them was super heavy. Each of them was, were 180 pounds. And the game object was a, I think it was a class five soccer ball. So it was really easy to get the, the game object, even though first had a specific one they wanted us to use. You scored points by scoring the balls in the goals. But more importantly, you had to control the position of the goal on the field. So if there were, there were, there were five zones on the field, the end zones were areas where you could score points if your robot ended in your end zone, which happened to be the same position where your robot started. So if, you're, if your robot did nothing the entire match and just sat there, you got 10 points for free. It was awesome. But <laughs> so if, if you were able to, to push the goal, the goal started in the middle of the field. And if you were to push the goal into the, the second zone from the wall, Cross the field away from you. If you're able to push the goal over there, then you got a big, huge multiplier for the the balls in the goal. So the three things that you got for points was balls in the goal, multiplier for the controlling of the goal position, and then ten points or something like that for having something on your robot touching your end zone. First, actually came out initially with a rule that said pretty much said you couldn't have a tape measure, and then somebody at the Virginia Regional had a tape measure that worked, and the administration who was there said, yeah, that looks great. That's legal. So then tape measures became a thing. So that was a pretty that was a pretty impactful decision. But, yeah, three ways to score in this game. Um, 
it was mostly about control of the positions of the goals. That was really what controlled the game. Well, I think the biggest thing that we hear about this game year is that there was one game-breaking robot that really dominated in some of their matches. Uh, Amanda, could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I mean, this is this is one of the robots that uh, everyone talks about still to this day. Um, Team 71, they could just, with their walking robot, just hold on to those goals and slowly move down the field. Um, there's multiple match videos uh, that I even watch now preparing for this that was like, yep, they're just like, you think they're beat out, but they just slow and steady wins the race and they got it there and then they had their tape measure. So it was, they were pretty impossible to beat. It's a pretty great robot. So Andy, did you have the opportunity to compete against this team when you were? Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah, <laughs> go, go, go figure. I think they beat us <laughs> multiple times that year also. Um, um, this, seems, this seems like a theme for this uh, series of years about having to compete against Team Hammond. Yes, yes. We now looking back, we beat them in '99, which was very rewarding. But they, they, I think they, they took that to heart, and they didn't ever let us beat them again. I think for many years. I think we were finally allied with them in 2011. So for 10 years, we were never allied with those guys. Love them to death, but yeah, they're pretty good competitors. Now, one thing about their robot, they had they had these these uh, this walking beam drive system that used that used file card. If you know what a file card is, it's a well, it's actually like a wood brush with metal little pegs coming out of the the brush that actually can clean off, clean off your file if your file gets has build up on it. You use these file cards to get the crap out of your file. So first had a rule in in the rule book that said like hook velcro is not legal as a traction device on the carpet team hammond 71 they abided by that rule but they said well we'll use file cards instead <laughs> it's a lot more traction than than hook velcro but um yeah that that worked for them and it wasn't it wasn't spelled out as being illegal and first never really put the gauntlet down and said no that's not the letter of the rule um so they allowed it and they went on i mean 71 went on to dominate pretty well uh, other teams throughout the year they added file cards to their i remember i remember 461 had a swerve drive with a file card break that year that was crazy and then other teams had file cards but no one had it designed in from the get-go like 71 did. so they they found a really good hole in the rules that they landed in and that worked well for them so, uh, Amanda, um, I'd, I'd like to think that the game design committee of the time, when they were designing this game, never envisioned a single robot being able to control all three goals. I mean, those goals were obviously very large, very heavy, you know, like 130 plus pounds each. And it, like, from an outsider's perspective, it feels like they were, they were going for one robot, one goal, um, and kind of maybe some power struggles along an individual goal while the other two get to play freely, right? Can you talk a little bit maybe about how, like, the game design committee might be surprised by when like an element is designed around one thing, but teams use it completely differently. It's every year teams think more out of the box than we can possibly imagine, which is great. Um, we like seeing things that, you know, we didn't think of. It's great that the first community is so creative and like going through the rules and how the game was played, because of course we all have the movies in our head of how we expect the game to be played. And one little twist and you're like, yeah, that, is completely different. Um, you know, we have the benefit now that the game design team is so large, there's more brains um, thinking about it, but the community is also grown so big that there's still new and creative methods um, to solving the game problems that we never expect to see. Um, so, so Andy, looking over the notes here, um, one of the things that I see about the 2002 game and season is that this is like the first time the the sim motor was widespread, widely used in, in FRC, right? Can you talk a little bit about the kind of big technology leap there? Previous to this year, the biggest motor in the kit of parts was like a drill motor, like it was a Johnson or a Mabuchi drill motor. And I think those motors were no higher than 300 watts, maybe, maybe 200, 240 watts, these little drill motors. And it was really, it was kind of hard to 
to mount them. But this year was the first year for it was it was a sim motor. It, it was the first name of it was the Chippewa motor, and it had an output shaft that was a spline. It was an oddball, um, like 0.7 modulus spline. People really loved the motor because it was a beast with regard to um, heat durability. Like it, it, it could hold its stall for a long time, and that's why it's still a popular motor in first today. Where you can, you can. It doesn't burn up hardly at all. I've, I've rarely seen sim motors burn up over the years. Where you would see the, the old can 700 series drill motors, they would burn up pretty easily. Back during this year, you can only use, I think you can only use two of those sim motors on your robot. And for many years past, there was a limited amount of sim motors you could use on your robot. Teams would add in motors to their drivetrains. I think our drivetrain this year had three had three motors on each side. So we had we had a six motor drivetrain. One was a sim motor, one was a, a drill motor, and one was a 550 motor. It was very odd. Because you didn't have unlimited motors to use wherever you wanted to. You had to really and really design in and choose where your, your motors needed to be used. Yeah, and and one of the, the challenges that folks who are participating in the game design challenge is gonna have to balance that we've brought up a lot um, on, on this on these recordings is balance of both available technology at the time when your game is to be played, um, you know, what what access to parts teams have, but also like what do you want, what do you want to see? Like what do you want to push teams for, right, Amanda? Like when it comes to comes to game design, like you have an opportunity to to kind of present a challenge that forces the floor to be pushed, right? Absolutely. Um, a lot of things we do when we're first starting out game design is we actually think of like what do we want robots? What do we want to see robots do this year? Um, you know, I've talked about it in the behind the bot show on Twitch, but 2018 we really wanted to see that autonomous mode you know, be challenged. So we like threw a ranking point there and made it more of that. But we, a lot of the times it's like, what do we really want to see the robots do this year? What's new? Maybe it's the vision tracking or sensors or what can we really push to really challenge teams to reach outside their their comfort zones? So that, that's actually a really good segue to um, our next game is 2003 Stack Attack, the dawn of autonomous mode in the first robotics competition. What, what all happened in Stack Attack? So Stack Attack was a very exciting game. It started with human players having to place um, four uh, totes or bins onto the field um, right before the start of the match. And then uh, once that was over, the robots took over. Either they could stack bins, knock over bins, um, get bins out of their opponent's zones. And then there was kind of this king of the hill end game of who was going to be on top. So it was very exciting, a lot going on in this game. There's a lot of things to do. From the previous games, um, we had kind of what I think is what was turning into like a typical field structure with that hexagon goal with the PVC. But this was kind of completely different with the giant ramp in the middle. Uh, Andy, could you talk a little bit more about what that ramp was like in the middle of the field? Yeah, it was the, the top of the ramp was, I think, HDPE, which is a really slick smooth um, white plastic. If you got up there and you tried to hold your ground, it was pretty hard to hold your ground. Um, you, it was illegal to latch into the metal grating next to the field. You, you could touch it, but you couldn't really hang on. You couldn't grasp the grating. Different teams thought of ways to, to, to hold their ground on top of the ramp. Um, the team that ended up on the winning alliance was Wildstang. They, they had two factors that, that helped them out. One was a really strong, very strong auto mode, but on, on top of the hill, they had these ramps that went down. So if you try to push them, you just drive up the ramps. I think our, some teams had vacuum that would hold suction cups on the ramps. Um, but really, th this, was a, this was a game about speed and about some it – was, it was pretty basic strategy. I think it was, it was exciting. I, I agree with Amanda that it was exciting. But at the same time, it was pretty – it was some basic strategy. The one thing that – that was different about this game compared to really all other games before it was it had three different playing surfaces on top of the field, top of the ramp you had that HTPE then you had this really strong metal grating which was the inclines on the ramp and then you had carpet on the floor 
So as we as we said, this is the beginning of autonomous, right? Like autonomous and like whole match flow thing was was totally turned upside down this year because you not only had you know auto, but you had this ten second period where humans could affect the match directly, right, Amanda? Right. I mean, right in the beginning, the humans were actually on the field, you know, placing the totes and bins and whatever orientation they wanted to um, to get off that field, get the gates closed. The wild staying. Um, swerve position control system really shown as well started to really show the potentials of what robots could do without driver interaction so this this is a game that andy that a lot of people talk about as being like broken per se which like kind of sells this game a bit short what was like the like intent of how this game was supposed to be played and then what actually happened okay so the intent i believe the intent on the game design was to award teams with points for creating stacks and then they would have to protect those stacks from a defensive robot it was it was pretty hard to make a stack it will and it was also hard to protect your stack a human player would go out on the field and make stacks at the beginning of the match and then they would run off the field and they'd have to stand on a like a, a sensor pad to get to make sure they're right in the right place back when they're done with the field so it was it looked unsafe because they're running around the field and they could have been tri they tripped or whatever, but they really do have to get back on this sensor pad, I think, to get the game started. And what happened after that was really just robots knocking down stacks. It was really hard to protect your stack, and it was even harder to, for a robot to create their own stacks. So the, the sad thing that we would see at regional events, like week one, week two, week three, is you would see people at the end of Thursday or Friday morning, you see them cutting off their stackers. Their stackers were slow. They, they weren't working very, very well. And it just strategically, it, it wasn't a viable way to play the game. It, what happened in reality was the strategy of, of when to knock down the stacks and where to place your stacks as a human player. And then the, the speed of, of knocking down the, the the central stack on top of the of the um, ramp, you got a lot of points if the totes were on the other side of the field. So you would push the totes onto the other side of the field, much like 2002 when you had to score points by pushing the goal onto the other side of the field. This this year you push the totes on or the, the bins on the other side of the field, and then and then there would be on the other side of the field there'd be stacked towers of of bins that your opponent put up. So we would go over there to the other side of the field and push our the bins over there, but then we would go and appear like we're knocking down the stacks of our opponents. That would draw defense from the opponents. Once they committed to come over and defend their stacks, we would cir circle back and get back on top of the field or on top of the ramp. And at that moment, most of the bins were on their side of the field, as was their robot. So they had a harder time. Um, ending the match by pushing us off the top of the ramp and getting the bins on our side of the field. Was, for us, it was kind of like a bait and switch. We would we would act like we would be knocking down all their stuff. We would once they would come to defend, we would circle back, get on the ramp, and and we had success doing that. The, the thing that people complain about with this game is it, it was a lot more destructive as far as knocking things down and just making the bins go everywhere as opposed to productive and stacking things and scoring points in a productive manner. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really tough one, right? Like you, as a designer, like you spend, you know, months, maybe sometimes years working on a game and you, you have the movie as Amanda puts it in your, in your head of what you think this game is going to be. Um, and then the, the point values end up dictating otherwise of what the game is going to be. Um, that's, that was a pretty tough lesson for, for first to learn about, um, what games could be. So right right before this here, in 2002, we just talked about this, the, the mythical 71 robot, like the game-breaking robot. And in comes in 2003, the potential for yet another one, Amanda. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, Trucktown and, and what happened there? Yeah, so Trucktown had this robot that expanded the entire space of the field on top of the ramp. Um, they were kind of on the field border, and basically um, they were told being in touch of multiple um, field components that their robot was illegal. So they had the potential to break the game, but were basically told, nope, 
you're not illegal and had to change it. But it was a pretty impressive robot because it's to span, you know, the width of the field. We really don't see nowadays. Yeah, I, I, I can't fathom, like, in modern first robotics competition, like, being able to effectively design a robot that doesn't get totally destroyed with, you know, what you have now for, for drivetrain power um, that is both robust enough, but also, like, A, fits inside the starting volume and, like, is underweight. Um, Especially in a game where you're supposed to knock that robot out of place and right. you'd have just wrecked wrecked robots everywhere i think and this is i mean this is one of the like more high profile for like old firsters where like a whole robot strategy is, is dictated illegal after it's been built we've seen this a couple times right and it's a uh, i mean it's a game of like cat and mouse of like teams wanting to push boundaries but also like the balance of what the game's supposed to be right it is uh definitely we start the q a system early you know, a week after kickoff, just to kind of gauge where teams are. What are they asking? You know, what are they thinking that, you know, we didn't think about or that. And it's really like, we only want to make minor tweaks to the rules. We really don't want to make anyone's strategy, you know, breaking, but sometimes maybe for safety or, you know, you never know that you've kind of got to target that idea and be like, nope, that's not going to, not going to fly this season. Yeah, it's definitely uh, got to be a, a really tough place to be. Um, that being having, you know, having to be bad cop, whatever, um, is is never really fun. Um, especially, you know, when there's you know lots of innovation happening. But like in almost every case that I can remember, like it's it's always been common sense prevails. Um, where um, in these like super edge case scenarios, like it it really ends up being the the right overall decision to. Um, you know, kind of skip around those robots. Many of us have spent many late nights debating the attributes of Stack Attack. It's been one of those games that's just kind of gotten beat up over the years, even though it was, it was a fun game to play. But if, if we were, there's a lot of us that would like to go back and play Stack Attack, but with the modern um, game design features of a protected zone for scoring. So I guess, Amanda, you, you're you concerned about protected zones with scoring because you're on, you know, modern days game design committee how much how much of importance is that with how you guys develop games uh protection zones are a major component to field design and more than just protecting scoring it's also protecting the robot actions of scoring and it's not just as simple as you know laying down a tape line and you know now this is safe but figuring out exactly how big that keep out zone is, you know, is the robot fully in the zone or is it as soon as that robot hits the zone, which actually makes the zone bigger than it feels on the field. But you also don't want to protect too much of the field because then there's really no interaction between alliances. So it's this really big balance of, okay, we want to protect this, but does this mean that like we're dividing the field too much? Is there still enough risk reward for teams to interact with each other? Yeah, definitely a lot of little levers to pull that have really big swinging effects um, that we're going to discover those effects uh, later in our, our later sessions where the modern games have more of these um, these protected zones. So 2003, a lot of people have, you know, a lot of distinct opinions about what that game both could have been, should have been, whatever. Andy, you, you like to tell the story about 2004 where um, those opinions got put to, to good use. Um, so first, can you explain, like, briefly what this game was and why and how it came to be from um, the outside perspectives that were brought in. Gosh, a lot, a lot happened between 2003 and 2004. Well, first of all, I'll just describe the 2004 game, first frenzy raising the bar. It was still two on two. Um, it had a lot of different tasks for robot to, to robots to do. So you could, as a team, you could pick one of those tasks because you could do it really well and you could excel highly at an event. First of all, there was a huge bar in the middle, like a 10-foot tall bar in the middle of the field. You could grab a hold of that bar, do a pull-up, get yourself off the ground, and get a lot of points. There were purple balls that were um, that were stored above the Alliance Station's heads to start the match, and they were released at different times depending on what happened during auto mode and such. But those purple balls, oddly enough, they couldn't be scored by robots. They had to be collected by the robots pushed through 
a hole in the Alliance station, then you would have a human player that would shoot the purple ball over the Alliance station wall into this PVC goal on your side of the your side of the field. Then you would get double all the points in that goal by placing a large yellow ball that very very brilliantly had a 2x graphic on it to show everybody that this is a doubler ball and it would put the ball on the goal and you would double all your points um in auto mode there was this little yellow ball i think it was a 10 point ball outside of the field and you could go over and grab that ball that's that's outside of the field and if if you knocked it off of the of its pedestal you got maybe some points during auto mode but more importantly I think all the purple balls came down off of your overhead ramp and you could start scoring those pur purple balls a lot sooner than your opponent. So you could be a, a purple ball grabber. You could be a big ball grabber and placer. You could go hang off the bar. You could play defense. You could do lots of things in this match. It was, it was a lot of fun to play. This game in 2004 was a lot simpler in the scoring and in the ranking situation. And also, in order to to advance through the elimination rounds, it was a lot simpler. The prior two years, the, the scoring was very complicated. It was difficult to explain how you would advance through the finals because it was um, it wasn't as it wasn't very easy to understand. Anyway, this was you could you could you could be ranked um, just through your win losses and ties, which was very simple for people to understand. The result of the result of what to the 2004 game came to be was caused by a really a, a whole bunch of effort that first put in the summer of 2003. They had I think six different committees, and these committees put together very well thought out game designs, and, and they presented the, presented them to first. Each committee had a budget that they could charge money. They could, they could pay. They could spend money on a budget that first paid for. Everybody on the committee was invited to fly out to New Hampshire on first dime, and we, we presented our games at Westwind at Dean's house, and it was a great trip. I was on a committee with um, Kyle Hughes, Paul Copioli, Dave Verbruggi, um, Dennis Hughes, Ken Patton. It was wonderful wonderful committee we were the best committee by far i'm sure but <laughs> so we were we, we were at um first we presented our ideas and first during that process they got five or six really well thought out vetted ideas that they they use for the next few years i i love this game it had a lot of different ways to score when i look at this game the one thing that i notice um is there are a lot of pathways for points as we're going to discover as we go through all of the, the games, even in this session, where the number of tasks or robot actions kind of ebbs and flows throughout game design's history. Um, and this one had a lot. Um, it's gotta be a challenge to balance those, right? Always it goes down to like, what do you really wanna see those robots do? Um, what do you really uh, wanna see happen in, in a match? Um, and it's a really hard balance because you have to, start you can't just think of like the here and now in that um game design but it's also like okay what's happened in like the previous few years what's some experience that teams may know how or have the ability to research how to do such as you know picking up balls even at this point you know in first history balls have a co are a common um game piece the teams are really starting to learn how to manipulate well and that kind of might make that more of a simpler task versus you know going to that the chin up bar wasn't the chin up bar was also in like a brief step on the field too to make it more of a challenge to kind of get there and um figure out how to grab the bar and so that was more difficult and it's more of like how you have to balance you know time for that to happen and what that like story of the match and as I'll say multiple times, like what that movie in the game designer's head really looks like. That um, that that bar you mentioned, and you know the namesake of the game, um, being in the center of the field, both a got all the attention because you know it's the center of the field and the audience is looking there. But it was a, it was worth a lot, Amanda. And so a lot of the robots, like a lot of the teams, really focus on this really difficult task, right? Yeah. Um, 
and that's, you know, the risk reward teams take in consideration and we have to take into consideration as game design, you know, what are teams going to look at that um, teams only have X amount of time before they compete? What are there's going to be those top goals? You put a lot of points toward, you know, that one object on the field and that's where teams are going to stress because they've only got, you know, two and a half minutes, two minutes in a match to earn points and what's the best way they can maximize their earning capability. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the things to remember about this year is um, it's fairly early in in first history and you know, the, the number of voters, like Andy said, for previous games was a lot lower back then. Um, and a lot of these elements are brand new to the first community. You know, they, they haven't been many games with a hanging bar or even slick surfaces to drive on. Um, Andy, could you talk a little bit more about those kind of challenges? And one of the things that would happen back back during these years was the, the first thing that the designers would do on the teams would, not even the designers, but really the engineer, the, the mentors did this first, who really were astute at looking at the kit of parts, would get a list of all the motors, analyze how many of these motors are illegal in your robot. And then there's, there were some motors that we, that first would not give us a motor spec for, a motor curve for. So you would have this motor in the kit. You would look at it. Oh, that's nice. You had no idea what it could do. You, you had no idea what the free speed was, what the what the stall torque was, what the wattage was. So there were a few engineers that would always post on Chief Delphi. Paul Copioli was probably the first one that would post all the motor curves that he could find. And sometimes there was a motor on there that was a very special motor. Like there was... I think this, it was either this year or the next year, 2005, that that was the first year for the 0673 motor. And this was a Fisher Price motor that for some reason had over 300 watts on it. It was this little small 550 series motor and it was had this magical amount of wattage that everybody had to have. So, but you couldn't hardly get them. So it was, it was kind of crazy. Anyway, first wouldn't just tell us what everything was in the kit. Part of the game challenge we kind of joked about, we had to find out all the specs of all the things in the kit. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of hard and uh, limiting the no number, limiting the amount of, of wattage on your robot was, was done by, by first, um, first engineers that really kind of wanted us to remain safe. They, they gradually opened up the number of motors that were allowed in the robot where we're to where we are right now. But back then, you had to really optimize your wattage to be able to use it in the right right places. So one of my favorite aspects of this game is the center hanging bar. And one, it was really high in the air, but two, it was shared between the two alliances. So in the end game, both alliances had to hang on it. Um, Amanda, that's not really something we see too much anymore in game design. Um, not really, and that really, you know, brings up that protected zone kind of concept again. Um, hanging uh, is usually one of the more riskier tasks for a robot to complete. Um, and as we do different challenging hangs, you know, want them to be safer. But back in 2004, it, it was one bar, um, and you know, all the robots would grab onto it, and we would see uh, robots, you know, um, climbing on top of each other to get their height up on that bar. Um, might have caused a few robots to, you know, lose a few, lose a few pieces, but it made for an exciting end game. And that's, you know, one thing in game design too, to look at is, you know, what's your audience experience as well. You have the robots completing all the tasks, but you know, that really um, exciting end moment of, you know, all the robots coming together to one central game piece and trying to hang on is really exciting and, you know, kind of don't know who's going to really win that element till the buzzer some, a lot of the times. And and we see that coming to the center show up in a bunch of later games too, albeit with, you know, separate elements for the most part, um, that there's something magical about all the robots doing a thing and then converging um, on, a, on a single region of the field for sure. Right. Um, so 2004, lots of action, lots of things to do. 2005 is one of the most beloved games um, in a lot of uh, first strategist history because, well, it was pretty simple, but a lot of different ways. Um, Amanda, what was Triple Play all about? 
Triple play. So this is um, one of my, this is, if not my favorite game, um, slightly biased because it was the first year I was a driver on the team. Three versus three alliances, which was new. Um, so there's more robots onto the field. In simple, it was a giant tic-tac-toe game on the surface. Um, but there was a lot of nuances in between, between owning the individual goals, um, owning the rows, but there were the game pieces were Tetras, which were these PVC pipe constructed game pieces. And um, the teams would stack them on basically bigger Tetras out in the field. And you'd stack them on top of red on blue, um, just trying to see where you could own and get the most points. There were also vision Tetras that started on the floor in the field for the robots to go for in autonomous mode, as well as these kind of like hanging Tetras that you could only score in auto as well. So more auto challenges are really starting to surface now. Yeah, definitely a, a lot going a lot going on in this game, but it's all the same sort of thing revolving around at least a similar game piece. Um, yeah, this is definitely one of my most favorite games because the concept is really easy to explain to, you know, grandma on the stands of it's tic-tac-toe with robots. And Yes, there's, you know, who wants to it, but it, it's tic-tac-toe, right? One of the cool aspects of this game is that the Tetras were introduced to the field via human player. Um, so one that was, um, we're, we're back to, I think, similar to 2003 with the human player and auto running onto the field. This human player also was maybe somewhat unsafe. Um, maybe Andy, you could talk about that and, and also some of the kind of penalties that might surround some of those zones as well. Yeah, so remember, remember 2000, 2002, 2003, there were these scoring opportunities, but no, no safe scoring opportunities or no safe, I mean, things were mostly destructive, especially in 2003. And so first made a point to make a safe zone or a protected zone for Tetra handoff between the human player and the robot. So a, a human player would have to be in the designated area. They're ready to go out on the field. A robot would have to go into this triangular-shaped zone that they were hovering over, or they were they had to be touching it, actually. So a lot of people put, like, zip ties or little things that would dangle down from the robot frame to touch this zone. Once the robot was in the zone, the student could run out there, place the tetra on top of the robot's arm or appendage or hook or whatever, then they would run away and the robot would, would, would go score the Tetra. So a defender robot would be hanging out near that zone. And if the defender would even touch, just, just barely tap the robot that was in the zone, then that would be a big, huge amount of points. I think it was it was a lot of points. Like if, if games were, I can't remember the point amount, but it was like maybe half or one third of the points that the team would usually score was that point total. So the amount of a penalty that was a potential in that time was was a huge amount. So teams had to be really careful. If a team got a handoff from a student with a tetra and they weren't actually in the in the triangular shaped zone, I think that was a penalty also. So. Um, first, try to do their best to designate penalties to make sure the game was played properly, when, when, in, especially in that zone. But the penalties were so high that it decimated some of the matches. And uh, it put a lot of pressure on referees to make a call that was very accurately right. And it was, it was pretty devastating to see some of these penalties sway matches. Um, that was probably the only negative thing about this game. I, I don't want to focus on that point. It was a great game, but... Those those keep out zones were a very key key aspect of the game, and and using deterrence like you know like penalties, Amanda is one of the tools in the GDC that we we're going to learn through this whole series, all five sessions, which levers have become favored over time for the game design committee to really shape gameplay, um, and really really shape exactly what the robots are doing throughout the course of a season. I mean, how do you how do you balance, you know, you've got this array of levers of, you know, robot design, penalties, whatever. How do you balance which ones you pull and how much? It's a, a kind of a really simple um, explanation. And we've talked about before about celebrating what you want to see. And it's more about rewarding those positive actions that you want to see from robots and teams and not necessarily always, you know, 
uh, negatively affecting because you don't we don't want to see matches won by penalty points. We'd rather see matches won by scored points. So you really want to uh, focus on rewarding the positive and um, keeping the focus there. Definitely. I, I tend to like games that really reward, you know, actions and really are, are built around that for sure. Um, now, Andy, something that is, you know, very near and dear to your heart and is your livelihood um, is in 2005 is really when we started to see like, or is really when we saw the birth of the COTS marketplace for um, specifically for first robotics teams. Um, and that, that was like a, a really controversial thing that you had to deal with when starting Animark, um, where there were some people who like liked the challenge of building their own things and some people celebrated this. Can you, can you talk about how those, those waters were a little bit muddy and, and how that all went down? Right, okay, so in, in 2005, two significant things happened. Um, with regard to how the robots were built, probably the, the most impactful thing was a kit with a kit chassis that was that was really a, a very very good, well designed, well thought out kit chassis and gearbox that um, teams with low resources could just put together, and they had an operational kit of parts chassis. Up until two thousand five, that was not a given. Teams with low resources, without engineers or you know, with a physics teacher and 10 well meaning kids, they didn't know how to make a kit of parts chat or they didn't know how to make a chassis that moved very well. They would need a lot of years of experience in order to catch up with the high resource teams. You would often see, you know, what, what, what we would call boxes on wheels not move for the entire match, and then they might come out the next match. And, and once that team would move, this is before 2005, once that team would move, then they would all cheer, yay, yay, we're moving. So that, so we, I think a lot of us mentors really put a lot of effort into making sure that low resource teams could compete at a high level pretty quickly. The first thing was the kit of parts chassis. And the second thing that happened was we started to Andy Mark and we were able to start providing um, off the shelf components that were hard to get. Like in 2005, you couldn't get aluminum sprockets anywhere except for like big ones from the go-kart market um you, there was there was no such thing as a planetary gearbox that simulated a sim motor until 2005 the only teams before 2005 who could who could make a a, a shifter were teams with really good engineers really good students and really good machining capabilities they had to have all those three things and after 2005, if you had a bake sale or you sold a bunch of pizzas or whatever, you could buy a shifter gearbox so you could catch up to those high resource teams. So that was that was a big year for um, COTS parts or commercial off the shelf parts. Leads into a really good balance of game design of, you know, looking at all the different types of robots you've got out there and making sure everyone can feel like they've contributed to the match. Um, in 2005, you know, hard thing was, you know, stacking the Tetras on top to keep stacking up, but you could also score underneath. So even if, you know, the robot couldn't get that reach arm, they still had the ability to score the main game piece, um, which was great because with the strategy in the game um, of connecting, you know, the rows and across and that that deeper strategy let those teams have a more meaningful impact than necessarily just like putting game pieces somewhere um also something slightly different leading off of that from 2004 we saw you know all the robots coming to the center of the field at the end of the match um and really kind of doing this next challenging element where in 2005 they were going back to their end zones to their lion station racing back and it was a really simple just get in your zone you know there was no extra movement needed from the robot other than your drivetrain um so still it was a nice simple end game um that allowed you know all robots as long as they're moving to complete so that was also a nice balance and one of the um parts about this game that also you know wasn't necessarily maybe designed into the game um, but was definitely a result was that the task of scoring on top of the Tetras got more challenging over time, the more Tetras that, that got scored. 
um, Andy, and I know um, also there was also the risk of knocking over your stacks on top of on top of the goals. What was what was it like to play that game and and go through that? Yeah, um, you could you could score theoretically a, an unlimited amount of tetras on top of the goal as long as you could keep getting tetras. So realistically, um, it got harder and harder to score each one on top. So you, we would see like stacks of eight or nine. I don't, I don't remember how what the tallest stack was, but I do remember remember seeing remember seeing stacks that were very very tall. Liz, like you said, as they got higher, it was you would see certain precarious situations where um, if, if you if you defended a robot that was placing like their tenth tetra on top. And their arm was kind of, you know, kind of wobbly up there. You could bash them, and they could knock over their stack. So they had to be really careful about that. And and along those lines, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Amanda, 2005 was like the last time we saw um, bumpers that weren't bumpers in the sense of uh, defensive wedges show up um, on the sides of a few robots. In that game kind of towed the line a little bit closer to being a little more full contact than we might have seen in later games. Um, what was it like to have to to drive against these devices and avoid them? It, um, you know, really started relying on, um, you know, a drive team is just that as your drive team. You really have to, you know, you're as a driver, um, you're focused on what your robot's doing and what your robots do and you really have to look at your drive coach to give you kind of what the big picture on the field is and you know to kind of give you that strategic of like you know this robot is coming this way and you're like you've got to either change course and direction or you know you know know you're going to get pushed or be ready for that so it's really um working as a team uh to have eyes all over the field I, I think we could probably spend the rest of the show talking about 2005 and like wanting to relive some glory days of such a really exciting game where, you know, the, the winner of the match at the time would, you know, change every few seconds because the game scoring was so dynamic. Probably my favorite part of that game for sure. Um, but our next game um, was 2006, Aim High. Um, and I, I think this game kind of took some of the, the exciting parts of, you know, back and forth scoring and kind of, Turn it up to 11, Andy. So what was Aim High all about? Okay, so Aim High was, was – now we have a three-on-three -three game. that was The precedent was set the year before. So teams were playing in alliances of three, and this was this was the last year without bumpers. So there was a lot of banging. There was a lot of robot metal versus metal. But um, you would, the teams would start in the, in the middle of the field, and they had – balls preloaded these were they used foam balls much like 2012 or much like much like this year with infinite recharge it was a it was a smaller ball teams would start with their balls they would drive toward this the goal in auto mode and they would shoot into a a a vertical hole in into the wall so the, a lot of line drive shots a lot of um a lot of different types of sh wheeled shooters but this was i think I think this was the first year for wheeled shooters. Is that is that right? Yeah, it, it was the first year for a lot of wheeled shooters, a lot of double double wheeled shooters and single wheeled shooters. So they would score points by putting the balls through the through the the hole in the wall. There was a, a there was a pretty significant in, advantage with auto mode. If you won auto mode, then I think you would you would go play defense on the other team, and there was some some swinging back and forth with who was scoring points during the during the flow of the match. Um, and then at the end of the match, you got points for getting up onto this ramp that was positioned right near your alliance station. But that was a that was a very big protected zone where your opponents couldn't get on the same ramp that you were on. So uh, as opposed to 2003, where the ramp was in the middle and they were fighting over this, you know, the king of the hill position, in 2006, the ramps were on separate ends of the field and there was no interaction, I believe, from you, you like you couldn't go play defense on somebody else's ramp. An exciting game. Um yeah, auto mode was like was pretty king uh in this game because of the, the 10 point bonus you got. The odd thing here was the was the flow of the game. If you won auto, then 
the offense, the other team had to go on offense first, and you had to go play defense against them. I and think that's that, how it worked. Yep. What did that actually mean, Amanda? Um, it was basically uh, whose goal was on and scoring was how you could tell on yeah. the field who was offense, defense, because the goal had the light above it. Um, and that – so auto was considered, like, the first um, round of the game. And if whoever won auto would go on defense, which meant – they had time to kind of like pick up balls and go that where the other alliance was their opportunity to score was then. So they either had to continue scoring what they didn't score in auto or, you know, go and get more game pieces. Um, and then it switched back and switched back for round three. And then in round four was just a free for all, which kind of gave the alliance that won auto a beneficial advantage because they would ha kind of have this like double period where they were just on offense they didn't have to go offense to defense or defense to offense so right. it right. was and there's there's a never mind just the, the point bonus but there's also a, a distinct advantage for winning auto because if you're a team that lost auto but also shot all of your game pieces um you're using your available scoring period to retrieve game pieces right so mm -hmm. there's this runaway case that could appear in this game um at you know higher levels of play where a lot of game pieces are moving through um which like on paper sounds like it's a super neat mechanic of like you like when you know the game you know who's going to be scoring first and this is one of those solutions for you've got a split field with you know two alliances doing things you know where to be looking right like as an audience um andy you like you know what's going to happen next yeah things were things were fairly predict predictable so you you had to execute well during the auto mode in order to get that advantage. And, and think back to the previous year, we, we, we talked about triple play where auto mode was, was not utilized as much. There was a much lower reward. So I, I think this was a response from triple play from the game design committee to say, we, we want to reward more autonomous um, success here. So we're going to, we're going to not only give you points, but we're going to give you a game, a game, um, a game advantage. If you win auto mode, you're going to, we're going to put yourself, on defense first to allow you to catch up and get more balls. So that was that was a, a very very significant advantage if you won auto mode. Yeah, autonomous mode was like super super king. Like uh, it had a huge deal for how alliance selection went. Um, like the the winning alliance, like the number one you know winning alliance that came out of Archimedes. The 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 first and second robots were really complementary. Where G ninety six had a like perfect ten for ten autonomous. Um, which would gain them almost every match they played. It would gain them that that period advantage paired up with the Thunder Chickens, who was like a, a lights out teleop score. Um, like that that runaway condition, like basically brought them to having that world championship. So one of the things about Aim High is that this was really the first shooting game that that we had. Um, so there were a lot of different components to that that first had to consider. Uh, Amanda, um, especially, you know, surrounding these game pieces and things like safety. Um, what all what all was it like back in 2006? Um, back in 2006 was definitely different than it is uh, today. Um, since it was new, it wasn't just new for the teams. It was, you know, new for first and new for like what was going to happen. And I think one of those big safety concerns was, you know, how fast are these ball is going to shoot out of these robots so there was an actual speed limit that you had to prove in inspection that you weren't going to exceed for scoring these foam balls that was a challenge in designing which you know we don't see nowadays uh, de designing that as well as um, recycling those game pieces back to the field you weren't just like putting them someplace and leaving them there you would put them in the goal and they'd return to the field to score again. So starting this like unlimited floor and getting that flow right of going through the goals and getting back to the robots was really a balance um, and key to this year um, to keep those scores going. Yeah, I remember a, a very important volunteer role was um, the the person who was in charge of unjamming the goals. Um, the, the pokey pokey person had the broomstick um, to ensure flow kept kept going right through the, mm -hmm. the game because so you didn't end up with a, a stack of, of of balls where teams you know start getting bounce outs and then you start getting into the field replay territory. Um, but like the super important job of just a human being the solution of, of agitating the game pieces. Um, 
So a little bit about robot design as well. Um, you talked about this a little bit, but this is really the first um, shooting game, and we we learned a lot about how the game piece act and what um, what happens there. Um, Andy, what kind of robot designs were were being used, and what was learned from them? I think speed on the field and traction on the field was was a big deal. Um, getting up to the ramp. Getting, getting up on the ramp at the end was not trivial. This was a it was a steep ramp, and it was it was diamond plate, and then a, a plastic surface on top. And you got a lot of points. You got a lot of points for getting your robots up there. Uh, on our team, we had a very overzealous driver, and he would he would uh, get up on that ramp as fast as he could. He would just spin his wheels on the diamond plate, and we had. What they were they were called high traction wheels. They were a new product from Andy Mark, high traction wheels. And it seemed like almost every match he would say, Gosh, I your your Andy Mark treads just aren't good enough. So well you, you just keep going on to the, the, the diamond plate, you just spin in your wheels. He's like a Dukes of Hazard driver. He just goes on that diamond plate, he just spins his wheel. There's there goes another eight dollar set of set of treads. Like, Jesus, this, this stuff doesn't grow on trees, Kyle. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of teams had a lot of damage with the, the treads because that diamond plate was really hard to deal with. Um, there were a lot of teams with with multiple wheels, like like not just four or six. But I remember like Team Seven Hundred Three had I think like a like a fourteen wheel drivetrain, some ridiculous amounts of wheels. It was almost like a tread system. And there were there were some teams that had really good tread systems. I, there there were the, the triplets up in up in um, Canada who were very successful in, in duplicating, I think they had four different robots. One was a practice robot, and then three different teams that were sister teams shared a design, and they all had, I think, I think they all had tread systems that drove the robots with. And that was a very successful design. Um, and I think, I think the, the treads this year were successful because they, they helped you hold your ground you couldn't get pushed around by another team, and also they they traversed up the ramp onto the platform really easily. So if you had a four wheel drive, maybe with Omni wheels, you weren't going to get up that ramp very easily. You needed to have a six wheel drive or an eight wheel drive or a fourteen wheel drive or a track system or whatever, because getting up on that ramp on that platform was was it took some good driver skill um, to do it right, and it. You couldn't do it very well with a holonomic drive system, that's for sure. There's almost competing challenges or tasks in this game that drove a lot of the trade-offs, speaking of drivetrains, um, that teams had to make. I mean, you want, when it comes to a, a, a mass game piece game, Amanda, you want a lot of the skills of being able to be nimble to collect many game pieces, but holding those are usually contrary to holding your ground and getting up objects, right? Absolutely. Um, and this is actually something personal experience in 2006 uh, we struggled with learned the hard way on how hard that ramp was um, that and you know we really designed our robot to be a shooting robot and because of that it was top heavy um, which wasn't good for the ramp but also it was quick robot it was it was either four or six wheels um, but it was more geared for speed than it was for traction so we were quick to the game pieces to pick them up um, and go there but when it came down to that end game we actually found it better to have an alliance partner kind of support us up the ramp and put us up there it was definitely a learning year of that and like really working systems together because you're mostly picking those game pieces up off the ground um, especially the misses you really wanted to get those off the ground and getting that system in your robot from getting those pieces off the ground and now into a, another different system that is now you know firing them at a higher rate of speed as well as then turning around and like okay now we're going to go up this really steep ramp with this not so easy grade so it was a it was definitely a year of challenges and really balancing where you wanted to focus different aspects of your robot yeah definitely like on the surface it seems simple right there's like pick up the ball put it in the goal right um but just the the couple little things that are added to this game, you know, terrain and you know being mostly unprotected while you're shooting, like makes those trade-offs really, really difficult. Those are the things that when you're designing your games at home, like 
those are the like the scenarios you got to play through, right? You got to play through the okay, what is your 25% robot, your 75% robot, and like what are the trade offs each of these robots are going to have to make? Um, for uh, honestly, like game tasks that are worlds apart that on this game, um, that made for a really exciting game. There's a lot of a lot of interesting nuances, both with you know the the scoring periods and the the different choices you had to make. Um, but the next game, 2007, Rack and Roll, um, was totally unique in its own regard. Um, Amanda, what was this this game all about? I heard there's something about a spider rack or something in this game. Yeah, uh, Rack and Roll really really kind of switched up and brought uh, different game pieces than we'd seen in the last you know few years. These were the game pieces were inflatable tubes. So not as indestructible as like some of the balls or totes or bins we'd been seeing in past years. And their scoring location was this giant spider rack in the middle of the field that had three levels of pegs. And the rack was moved in the beginning of every match. So there was no like strict placement of where uh, this rack was going to be for like the auto mode. Um, there were vision um, lights at the top of certain rungs to get them. But not only were these rungs at different heights, but they were suspended with chains. So they weren't rigid even in their own structure. They had movement to them, which made them more of a challenge. Um, as well as scoring was unique that it wasn't just, you know, put something here and get points, depending on the patterns and what kind of tubes you put where was your score could be really high with just one placement of tube, or you could just get two points with one placement of tube. So it's a very um, interesting strategic depth game. There's also like, again, another game here, Andy, where there's like totally contradictory robot tasks, right? There's the scoring the tubes, but then there's the crazy end game, right? Yeah, there were, there were not too many teams that could do both of those things very well. So many teams would pick one or the other. Um, only a few teams in the world could do both very well. So at the end of the game, um, you got points if your robot was 12 inches off the floor. And I think you got some points if you were four inches off the floor also, but not, a, not that many points. I think you got like um, 30 points, I think, if, if your robot was 12 inches off the floor. That was, that was a lot of points comparatively to the other points that were on the field. So in an alliance of three, you would, you would have one robot that would act as the lifter or the ramp and then two robots that would get up on the lifter robot. And so you, you kind of, and, and during, during qualification matches, just like other game, other years, you're randomly selected with these other, other teams and you might not have a lifter on your robot. So you're kind of, you're kind of out of luck on there, but in, in the finals, you, you really had one designated ramp bot and, and two designated really specific um, tube scores that were, really good at doing what they're doing and that that made up a really good alliance i think this was this was a year where that, that all three robots really had to be very very strong in order for you to do very well there, there were other years that um to win at a regional level you, you could you could win with one or two good robots in your alliance of three but this was this was one of the first years where all three robots had to be had to be very strong if you had a weak link you couldn't beat another another alliance very well I think one of the key things with the tubes here is first gave us three separate game pieces with these tubes. One was the keeper, one was the ringer, and one was the spoiler. So the keeper was your auto mode tube. And if you got the auto mode tube onto the peg of your choice, then you kept that peg to be designated for that color. So if you were the blue alliance, you had a blue keeper in your, in your grip, you went and placed it on the, on the rack, and you, if you made it there, then no one, no one could change the color of that peg. So that was a very key advantage for you. And then during teleop, you could score just the regular ringers, which what your blue or red ring uh, tubes were called. Then you also had a spoiler. What we would do with the spoiler is we would give it to the team, probably the the least amount of placing ability on the team so the team that was the slowest to place their spoiler they would just drive on the other side of the field and they would kind of kind of move the spoiler around acting like they're going to place it on a difficult place for the other team to deal with the other alliance to deal with so the spoilers were black and that would nullify any any color that's on that peg so the spoiler was a was a really cool 
um, strategy move that you could make by by messing with the other team, the other alliances score. It's been a while since we've seen a, a specific dedicated game piece for that. I mean, we saw this mechanic come back a little bit in power up where all of the game pieces were neutral, but you placing a game piece would affect your opponent's score by, you know, owning the goal, changing the ownership of the goal or something, mm -hmm. which we're going to cover in a later session. Um, but it's interesting to see some some origins here of, of that. So one thing that was like super unique about 2007, like specifically to this year, is the the weight class versus size rule that appeared in Rack and Roll. Amanda, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, this was a very unique aspect, which started right when you were designing your robot, where uh, how tall you wanted to be. There was more options to be taller um, in your starting config, where you could be up to 72 inches tall, but to do that, you had to cut weight out. So, you know, the lowest weight class of robot was only 48 inches tall, but they could be the full 120 pounds, where the class three robot could be taller at 72 inches, um, but it was still only 100 pounds. So it's definitely that trade-off where, yes, you can build taller, you can start taller, you can be up there, but you're going to um, lose that weight advantage of, you know, if you want to be in a pushing match or, you know, just putting pieces on your robot. You'll probably be Swiss cheesing a little more. I think one of my favorite things about Rack and Roll um, that also shows up later is the um, individual effectiveness of a game piece, regardless of where it's placed. Yes, that changes as you add, build more game pieces, but a game piece individually being worth the same on level one versus level three. Um, and that that really played into some teams' hands, like, the, the super rookie sensation of 2056 comes to mind when thinking about this game of a robot that in the regular season could not reach the third level. Um, but I mean, Amanda, when you're just, when you're designing games and thinking of, you know, these, again, we're coming back to the balance of robot capabilities versus points rewards. Like this is one of those, those games that shows up with um, kind of like an, everybody can contribute, right? Absolutely. Um, the, height of the peg and kind of like where you could pick up game pieces was very similar. You did have to go across the field to pick up um, your game pieces off the ground, but they were kind of more at that height, but it didn't matter if you couldn't get up at all. If you could do the same row on the bottom rung, then you were just as effective. And there's the balance, of course, of balancing your own team's effectiveness versus um, like the robots you're facing, Andy. Like. Like there's different strategies of if you can place high, but you're playing against you know three twenty fifty sixes, you're probably going to place high, and those those tubes are mostly undefended, right? You had to decide if, how you're going to place your tube. Are are, are you going to place your tube to optimize your offensive score, or are you going to place your tube to to get in the way of the other other alliance scoring a row or a column? We learned in this game that if you can if you can start your first tube or two. On the other side of the rack, that's where that's where it was most impactful for us. We would we would start the tube on the other side of the rack, not not on the exact opposite side, but maybe like at two o'clock or at ten o'clock. We would start there and then work our way around and try to get a row of four or five. That was pretty. That was pretty. That was a pretty good score if you could do that. Um, whereas if you just started scoring on your side of the of the rack. The, you would lose the sides pretty easily. So you had to kind of work on the sides and then defend defend the front of your rack. If someone was coming around for the front, you would do it. You would just knock them out of the way and try to keep them from scoring on that side. Another thing is if if I think if if red scored on a peg and you were blue, I think you you could score a blue a blue tube over over their red tube and you could reown reown the peg. But you couldn't put a third one up there. There was there wasn't enough room for three, but there was room for two on each peg. So the ownership of that of that peg um, would could change from one tube to the next. It was just really it was hard to get the second tube on. It wasn't as easy as you would think. There are some teams that really just focus on the end game, because um, the end game being that thirty points. Sometimes it just made more sense to um, you know play defense or just get in the other team's way while they were trying and then near the end just be that robot that you know you unfolded this huge long ramp that your teammates could just drive up on and easily score those end game points which is part of that balance and, and that was a very protected move that was um 
if, if you do try to defend the opponent from doing their in-game ramp move, you got you got a pretty big penalty. So that first made sure that the team's doing the ramp action at the end of the game. If they were doing it in the right spot, they were very well protected. Yeah. Um, and in this game, we once again have a center scoring element where everyone is trying to score, which um, I know – led to a lot of pushing and shoving. Um, so this is the, the first year of bumpers that, that were in place. And I think it's probably a good year to start that. We had um, our team, <laughs> our, uh, the Technocats back then picked a theme every year. And we, we sucked bad in 2000, 2006. So in 2007, we were going to focus on returning to our to our greatness in our minds. So our theme of 2007 was back in black. We were we were back and we were gonna be all black. So everything was black on the team, even though we were red and white. And so we, we made pleather, pleather bumpers. That was our bumpers. They were, they were pleather. Cause back then you didn't have to have red or blue bumpers and you didn't have to have your number on your bumpers. You just had to have bumpers. So the material just had to be durable material. So we picked pleather and it was it was awesome. We had we had this um, this rock and roll theme. We, everybody dressed up. We had backstage passes that actually got us VIP passes at Champs. Who would have thought that? But that worked. Um, it was crazy. So bumpers were a key thing. Um, it was good for the robot for robot play. It was really bad and hard for the teams to comply with the bumper rules. It, who would have thought that? first creates these really simple bumper rules and but then the bumper rules have to grow because everybody has all these questions about bumper rules and and what what the what 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 this became was this was an exercise in teams being able to follow a spec this was the first time that the game design committee and really the the engineering staff at first said here is something that has to be a certain way on your robot you don't have the ability to make a design there might be a, a different, better design or a different good design. No, 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 no. It has to be this design. And that was, for multiple reasons, that was a, a good exercise for the teams. A lot of teams didn't like it because they'd say, well, we can make a better bumper system than this. This is ridiculous. But they had to follow the spec in the first in the first robot rules. And I think that was a great, I think that's a great aspect of how first FRC robots are built. Is It's an exercise of, following a spec that you don't have you don't have um, a choice of what it is whereas the rest of your robot you're the inventor you're the creator you can be very creative with your robot design but for bumper rules you have to follow their spec a lot of new things that show up in rack and roll um i i like the the switcheroo of that that you talked about of main scoring happening in the center of the field end game at the splits whereas you know uh First raising the bar was sort of kind of opposite, where it was mostly action at the ends and then coming to the center. Um, same thing we have in infinite recharge of scoring at the ends, um, you know, end game in the center for sure. Um, I like rack and roll. Um, it was the first game that I personally um, got to see like in person with my own eyes um, instead of watching on you know a webcast or a television on like NASA TV or something. Um, and I was just kind of in awe of the rack itself. Um, because of how big of an element it was. The, the rack is interesting because while it wasn't like super advantageous to do it, because you were, you know, when you were in the act of placing a tube, you moved the rack. There were some instances where you might notice your opponent scoring and want to pull the rack a little bit away and have the rack be moving for a while um, to make it harder for your opponent to score once you already placed yours. Um, that direct like or indirect interaction with the robot shows up again um in, in power up when you're placing cubes and it changes the state now you couldn't manipulate the 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 scale directly with you know intentionally per se in in that but the the indirect interaction of the place you score changes based on another robot interacting with it it's, it's interesting to see some lineage here so our last game we're going to talk about is the 2008 game first overdrive also known as uh shifter heaven <laughs> um andy do you want to talk a little bit about what this game was all about Sure. Okay. So first overdrive was three on three. Once again, um, they had, for the first time, they had something called hybrid mode. 
which which was essentially auto mode. Most teams just used it as auto mode, but they first called it hybrid mode because they had a human player that was able to send like a remote control signal to the robot to, to tell the robot when to turn. So that was that, that was a big deal during kickoff, but I don't think many teams utilized hybrid mode from the human player standpoint. I think most teams during auto mode just ran an auto mode and just ran their sequence of auto mode. But anyway, I digress. You get you get points for going around and around the, the oval of the racetrack on, on the standard size playing field. Um, you get points for that. I think you got you got points for knocking off one of the big balls in hybrid mode. And then you also got points for the ball cycling around the course, just if you just rolled it. Then you got even more points if the ball cycled around the course and you launched the ball over what they had called the overpass, which was like a like a jungle a jungle gym looking thing. So you would launch the ball over the overpass, and then you would try to corral the ball again, drive it around, and launch it over the overpass again. And the teams that did did that did really well were the teams that could traverse the course quickly in auto mode. They could knock off balls when they when they wanted to easily, and um, they could grab a ball quickly and and launch it effectively. Um, and do that over and over again. I think I think some teams got over 10 or 12 laps during a two-minute match. I think that was pretty common. Um, but there's a, there's a lot going on with this game, but that's that's pretty much how you scored points. Um, so drivetrains were were a key thing. Um, I remember at, at Champs, Andy Mark had a promotion where we had a race at the end of Champs, and some of the we, we tried to we tried to have racing robots. And one of the robots, I think, went about 20, 20 feet per second. It was it was a fun game. Um, I, I like the previous game personally better, but Overdrive was a fun game. This was the first game that they had a theme, I think. I don't think they had a theme during other games. They had a racing theme, racing theme for, for this game. Uh, this game's super interesting, right? Like where the the, the pace of the match is, is super dictated of like, Yes, it's comp. It's 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 in one hand, it's like you can describe it in a sentence of robots racing around the track, but there's all these qualifiers of what they do while they're doing that, right? Like the you know the three different ways to score points with the, the game pieces, you know, hurdling or placing them at the end, whatever. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. That's like super kind of interesting. Uh, Amanda, one of the things that existed, um, you being a systems engineer um, on this field, was one of the things that GDC tried was a new way for automated scoring, right? Can you talk a little bit about how what that was and how that worked? Yeah, there were um, lap counters, per se, that they were uh, trying out to each robot had their own um, lap counter so that the scoring system would automatically track the robots going around the field. But that's all I know about that. Yeah, um, definitely was a, a neat thing. There was a lot of like IR-based stuff that happened that year. Um, I like the hybrid period because it was really open ended on what you could do with it. Um, my my team used it simply to just tell our robot where the game pieces were, and then it ran an auto mode based off that. Um, whereas some teams would would use it to send real commands, um, which like because it was an open ended task and something new, um, like I thought that was pretty cool. Max robot size that year, the footprint was like what Andy like twenty eight by thirty eight, and these are forty inch balls. Max robot, the perimeter was pretty small. I think first, the first, first, and the game design committee and engineering would like to play with the perimeter of the robot because they don't want teams to just use the same exact drive chassis every year. They want the teams to have to redesign their chassis every year. Not so much anymore, but back then they liked to change the, the dimensions from, from time to time. But Robots got very tall. This was one of those years where, as opposed to the year prior, that you you could only be so big from from a, a lateral standpoint. And it fit within a cylinder. Yep. So if if you if you were too big past the cylinder, you were illegal. So we as inspectors had to check for that. But also, if you were very tall and you fell over, you had to either get back up right away or you had like a 10 second. After 10 seconds, you were counted out, and therefore you weren't going to keep getting penalties after 10 seconds because you were bigger than the cylinder. So, Amanda, um, you had the pleasure of competing against um, 
one of the like most unique, but also really controversial robots that came out of um, that year. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, 1519 actually kind of started with what in present day, modern day, we know as more like configurations of robots, where the core of their robot was this little tiny speedster that could like run lap fast. And you almost like didn't see them. You really had to like look for them out in the field because they were just tiny and quick. But they also had this like outer shell that they could put over this uh, little robot to mm -hmm. manipulate the game pieces <laughs> if they that was what was needed for their alliance. Um, unfortunately, I think with rule updates, it was determined that those were two separate robots since the configurations of where electronics were, or I don't quite remember um, the exact makings of what, but they had to kind of choose which configuration they were going to go for for the events. But it was really fun to see them in both of them because they both, both configurations were really good robots. Um, so I think one of the things that lent itself to um, wanting to have those configurations is the quantity of game pieces available. Amanda, do you want to talk about that? Sure. So there wasn't, um, in, you know, modern years, there was either like a plethora of game pieces or there's like a game piece, you know, per robot almost at minimum. And this year there wasn't, there was only four um, total game pieces, two were red, two were blue. So it made sense for some teams um, to just strategically be a lap robot. And all they would do is run those laps and maybe get in the other person's way. You let your other alliance members focus on the game pieces. Yeah, one of the things that was that, you know, looking back at this game that um, from a robot design perspective that really drove things was the, that end game of placing your game piece on the overpass. Um, you know, it in itself, that one action was a pretty, you know, pretty large amount of points. Um, so it felt like it was important at the time, but um, in, in hindsight, it almost was a bit of a red herring. Um, if you were really fast at hurdling, um, you could almost like you could outscore it with just a couple cycles. Um, and I mean, the the best robot in the world did exactly that. I mean, eleven fourteen, like they completely ignored this placement task. Um, they could get game pieces off, but they they made up all that difference in just being the best hurdle bot in the world. Um, and that's like it's really interesting because like that proves that a lot of these games you have to look at them holistically, right? You have to, like, both when you're, like, you know, ripping a game apart that you just got, but also once you design a game and you want a task like this to be advantageous, you have to play just like Furch does. And, you know, Amanda talked about, you know, the human playing through a game. you got to walk through these scenarios and see if it's actually valid for the teams to consider. Um, and, like, while it was a thing that happened on Einstein, I mean, you know, Chickens did it in the finals, um, it wasn't like the direct thing that changed the outcome of the match. It just, it looked really cool as a buzzer beater, that kind of thing. Um, but I, I very much remember that being a thing a lot of teams could do and then realized later in the season that like they just should just hurdle more. <laughs> yeah. Right. Cause it was almost a completely different action than the hurdling, right? Like hurdling, you know, there were some like launchers who would just kind of like throw the ball over and didn't need to be precise where that end game task was a lot more precision and almost time you know, sucking to put it up there. So with the hurdling being as worth it was, was that's was where kind of that strategy went, which was fascinating to watch. For sure. And I mean, the, the field design itself lent itself almost to like making hurdling advantage. On one hand, like Andy, you could be in the camp of, I'm going to build an elevator robot that, you know, kind of gently pushes it over so I can always control what that game piece is, right? But the field was really good at crowning the game pieces for anybody who hurled them, right? Right. Right, you, the the teams that were the best ones, they would they would they would hurdle it over, the overpass, and then they would they would go catch it on a bounce, at the end of the wall. Um, so some things you had to watch for though is these balls were so big that they they were their own weapon against the robot. So I know our team, we got knocked out of the finals because we went to grab the ball. And we, I think we hit the wall at the same time. It just knocked us over. This, the ball in the wall was so was so impactful. It just knocked us on our butts. I'm like, oh crap! And we couldn't get back up. So that that stunk. Another thing that teams would have a hard time with there was there was a big penalty for going backwards against the flow of the one way direction of going forward and turning left. 
So if you were if you weren't if you weren't very careful in how you placed that ball on your overpass, or if you got caught up on the overpass and you cross back over the line like like the start line then you got a big penalty and that was that was um hard to overcome kind of like 2005 some of those penalties were just difficult to overcome and like the the existence of some kind of flow control was important for that game right i mean the the object of you know get as many laps as you can as many cycles as you can necessitate really fast robot speeds um, if you have robots going whatever direction they want, you end up with a lot of high-speed collisions, a lot of broken robots, right? So yeah. like these, these, these guardrails um, needed to exist. Uh, Amanda, in your, in your toolbox, these kinds of like match flow dictating like almost like guardrail penalties um, are, again, one of those tools that are in your tool belt that um, you have to balance you know, their effectiveness, right? Balance their effectiveness and balance other causations they may have on the field. One thing that, you know, was put in place was there's that giant wall kind of down the middle of this field of plexiglass. And while, you know, from kind of the audience point of view, it was see-through, depending where you were in the driver's station, it almost created a mirror effect where you would lose your robot if you were driving and not, couldn't clearly see, you know, especially on the opposite side of the field, what you were doing. So it's really a cause and effect of like, how much is this needed? Like that was definitely needed in that game to really protect the high speed collisions because it divided, you know, front and back going back at each other. But it also created some difficulties from the drivers that might not have been easily seen when just like, you know, looking at it from an audience point of view. Oh yeah. I, I very much remember being blind in the driver box of that game, being very frustrated. Um, uh, because that's not a thing as a team we, we thought of, uh, back then of, like we we had a we had a big beautiful welded overpass, um, but there was no there was no polycarb on it um, at our practice field, and so we were very surprised when we got to the first event that there were stage lights shining down on this shiny piece of polycarb that made like if you were in driver station like three was probably like being the worst of there was a whole corner of the field you could not see, and while like the pieces were necessary to prevent you know these little skinny manipulators from like skewering each other through the overpass, um, it. It was part of the challenge, as we like to say, um, that may not have been totally intended, um, yeah. which is like I don't know, fun to fun to think about when thinking about these these older games. Um, and now now like almost from from an outside perspective, when there are vision challenges, um, they're very intentional, right? It's not like an accident. It's there's a big obstruction, like 2016, the defense is whatever, or you know, you could only see through parts of the scale. Only parts of it were actually clear. Um, in 2018, um, it's it see it feels from a competitor's perspective very intentional when there's a vision challenge um, compared to this, which might have been almost unintentional. This, this was still a game that had a lot of defense, a lot of penalties for robot to robot interaction. I think I mean I was I was mainly focused on refereeing this year. I wasn't coaching our team, um, but I remember very impactful like combative robots just banging banging each other a lot a lot of frustrating people for for either not calling a penalty or calling a penalty because there's there's too much interaction yeah there was some rather high profile um like intentional tipping calls um that happened that year partly probably um thinking back when talking about vision you couldn't see in that corner um like if you know that that third quadrant if you're standing in driver station three you might not know you're barreling through a robot yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, it was very easy to tip over your own alliance members if you weren't careful because you couldn't see as mm -hmm. they were hurtling. I, uh, I I did that once. <laughs> Not that I would know from personal experience or anything, but <laughs> yeah, apologize to a few teams. Yep, there were definitely a lot of challenges in that in that game, um, and that that's a game that what's nice about it is it it grew through the entire season, um, where the average score continued to to rise. As you saw events happen, it never really like plateaued per se. Um, I'm like individual robot performance maybe plateaued, but the the floor as a whole continued to rise as people, um, you know, teams um, figured out how they can contribute in meaningful ways to that game. So that 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 was our last game. Um, there's there's a lot of like weird wrenches that appear in all of these games. Um, this is like the the refinement of the modern era. Right where we switch to the the three robot alliance era and kind of refine what that interaction looks looks like. 
all these games look like um, a first robotics competition game. It's the subtleties that make them all unique and weird. Everything from you know, weight classes to um, you know robot disablement while you're loading it with a game piece and all all kinds of fun stuff. Um, but this like this group of games, like especially like 2004 to 2008, um, seems to be where a lot of the like the big crowd of alumni come from. So there's a lot of voices of hey, we really like these games. Um, in the community. So you hear a lot of things like, ah, oh, triple replay, or I'd love to play aim high again, um, that show up because they were, they were really good games. Um, they would probably be different if we played them again, but there was a lot of really good stuff in these games that, um, at least advice I would have is, um, if you're designing these games, look at the mechanics of how some of these games work, everything from the weird stuff of offense, defense stuff, um, all kinds of the, the weird things that appear in these games. Yeah, and I think some of the mechanics from these games end up being used in future games as well, especially the more successful ones. So some of those same mechanics you see repeated in in later years, um, including you know, some very recent years as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, this is pretty much the end of our show. Um, really want to thank both Andy and Amanda for taking time out of their extraordinarily busy lives to come chat robots with us. Um, it's always really fun to tell, you know, trade stories about um, things that happened in our, our first careers and, and learn some history about these really interesting games. So thank you so much, both of you, for coming on and, you know, sharing some stories. Um, also want to thank Brad Thompson, the uh, magician behind the screen, who uh, is stitching all of these slots together and, and making it into a nice, pretty show. And also to Matt Malinak for... Um, you know, directing this entire show and kind of bringing everybody you see on camera together and, you know, make us talk robots and, and have some fun. Um, on behalf of Liz and myself, uh, we want to thank you all for tuning in um, and we will see you for session three. Hey everybody, welcome to the live Q&A portion of our session and episode tonight. We are very grateful that both Amanda and Andy were available once again to join Liz and I uh, here at this uh, awesome webcast here. We're going to take your questions from chat and try to answer them to the best of our ability. Um, we're going to have a bunch of questions in the can. Um, we're probably only going to spend about 15 minutes or so on uh, this one and try to be done by nine o'clock like we kind of promised. Um, but if questions are interesting, maybe we'll run a little bit long. But um, so we're going to jump into them because we've got a lot of great questions. Um, first one is straight for Amanda. When uh, designing a game and thinking about the robot rules, um, how do does you and your team uh, determine what the extension limits and rules should be? So it's a lot like when we're determining zones and that we really want to see like what's on the field, how uh, much does a robot have to extend to be able to complete match objectives, like if you're scoring a game piece, or how far do we not want you to extend to make scoring too easily, like especially when there's like shooter games, and just really like looking at what's on the field, size of everything, and what kind of fits into the bounds of what we want robots to see. Yeah, that makes a bunch of sense. I mean, the the little number, you know, 12 inches, 13 inches, whatever, like totally makes or breaks different robot designs. And that's a, that's a hard lever for you guys to have to have to pull. Um, all right, so we got a bunch of fun questions, you know, kind of like not necessarily specific to, you know, this this uh, this group of, of games that, you know, the fun things, right? Like um, this is an everyone question. Start with Andy on this one. What's your favorite FRC game and why? <coughs> Now, is it, are we talking about just this group of games or all time? All time. Oh, okay. All time, my favorite was 1999. The, the surprise of adding alliances, moving from 98 to 99, teams were amazed and kind of ticked off about it, but it became a master, a master stroke because, because the teams were able to share their designs and their creations with all the other teams. Um, the alliance faction, the alliance factor is a, such a huge collaborative thing. 
And when that came about in 99, it was, it was just a, such an immense um, genius move by first. Uh, Amanda, what about you? What's your favorite game? Um, I think on the top of my list is definitely 2005 Triple Play and 2018 Power Up. And I think for very similar reasons. On the surface, they're simple games. You're either tic-tac-toe or, you know, you want to get the scaler switch to your side, but they have such strategic depth to them. And I, that's what I really enjoy. Makes a bunch of sense. Liz, what's, what's your favorite game? Mm, I still think... Um... Stronghold is one of my favorites, and like Amanda said, and like I think Danny said on our last show, 2005 has a very special place in my heart. That was a game I played. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely really like uh, like 2016 a lot. Mm -hmm. um, like, where you, what what makes a good game for me um, as a, as a, is a game that is both engaging and entertaining for both the teams and the audience through the entire season. And Stronghold is one of those games that everybody enjoyed for the entire season we got bored it always kept evolving it was great um we have a lot of questions and it's 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 fun to sort through them um amanda what is your favorite game piece Ooh, this is this is a tough one favorite game piece hmm um we're gonna go with like the most entertaining game piece in my experience and that's got to be the overdrive um balls because when i was when playing the game, they were so big that I could not pick them up with my arm swing. So those are definitely the most like entertaining game pieces I can remember. What about you, Andy? That was mine too. It was a, <laughs> a big fastball from 2004, 2008. Um, I guess, I guess the second one. Uh, I guess I don't know if this is my favorite. It's just standing. I have a hard time with favorites, but anyway. Um, the 2009 goofy strappy ball that we had to use it was it was such a weird thing to mess with i i think i don't know if it was my favorite but it was so unique what were those called it was like orbit balls space. orbit balls yeah and then they had the bonus ball that you uh yeah i got some stories about those but um, <laughs> yeah that was a pretty cool game piece i thought yeah definitely that, that's one that stands out to me too. Just like, mm -hmm. it's so weird. It's a ball, but not like, yeah, I agree with that one. And then like, when I was a student, like the 2008 game pieces were bigger than I was. <laughs> I was I was pretty small when I was in high school. Uh, I guess I'm still short now, but yeah, those were just massive <laughs> game pieces. Um, this, I can start with Andy on this one. Um, this one, you might have to think for a second, but what, in your opinion, was the greatest evolution of in robots from one season to the next? Um, 2002 to 2003. Main reason, autonomous mode was introduced in 2003. And again, first, what they did was they didn't give us any warning. There was no advance notice about any of this stuff. Upon kickoff, they said, oh, you're, you're going to control these robots now during an autonomous, autonomous mode for the first 15 seconds of the match. We're all like, whoa. And back then, back then, there was really not a huge demand to make a second robot. What, what, what that did was not only challenge the software team to get their stuff right and get all the sensors right on your drivetrain and whatever, but that really challenged all the teams to build a second, all, all the teams at the at a high level, to, to really think about building a second robot to in order to compete at a high level consistently. That that's a pretty solid answer. That's probably mm -hmm. one that I would point to as well. Um, huh? Yeah. No, that's a really great great answer. Um, all right, Amanda. This one might hit a little close to home, but what is the best field shape and why? Um, well, I'm going to have to go with the, the field shape that I'm most used for, the rectangle. Um, you know, it fits in that basketball court. It's really easy for, you know, people to relate to when you're talking about first. Like, yeah, you know, the field fits in a basketball court. So getting that same imagery is, is pretty nice. So I'm going to say rectangle. Seems reasonable. Hmm. <laughs> it's fun to sort through these. Um, let's see. Uh, we, we asked this one last night, but I like hearing this answer. Um, 
I'm going to ask this one to both of you, uh, but we'll start with Andy. Um, what game piece or game challenge would you like to see in a future game? I, I'm going to twist the question a little bit. Can I say what entire game challenge that I would like to replay for a whole, like a, the whole game, just redo it again? Sure, we don't have any rules. Sure, here. those are our rules. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so I, I want to see twenty. I want to see year two thousand. The year two thousand. I want to see that game played again. I think it was a really good game. It was a really simple game, but there were some pretty cool aspects of scoring and descoring. And I think it would be a totally different game with the amount of power on the robots that we have now, and also a lot of the, um, the off-the-shelf items that robots have, that robot teams have available for them. So I'd like I'd like to see the gameplay. From, from 2000 played again. Yeah, I've, I've actually never thought about that being played with modern robot rules. That'd be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Huh. Amanda, what do you think? I, th I think 2005. Um, that game piece was, you could manipulate it in a, a lot of different ways. Um, you could grab it, which is, um, it was an easier grab since you're basically grabbing a PVC pipe, but then you're still dealing with this more 3D object that you have to orient and play somewhere. And similar to Andy, I mean, I'd want to see that game played with modern robots. It'd be really cool to see what changed from then to now. Yeah, triple replay is a thing that like, <laughs> it seems to be a fan favorite because it's such a like a good game concept, right? Um, I, I would love to see that game yeah. again too. Um, and like to see if in modern robot rules, if um, like, arm and stick is still king or um if you know some more active mechanisms would be the way to go with modern uh you know cots items and and robot rules yeah um so this is a question from the chat um the question is um and i'm gonna maybe ask andy since i know you've been on a team for a long time for this so when did scouting become such a discipline for match strategy and or alliance selection or, or really how has it changed over the years or has it changed at all really i think as a whole within first it's it's changed a lot over the years i, I think that now pretty much any team if they're going to be successful as as an alliance captain or as a first round pick they really got to have their their scouting done and have their pick list made and they have to have reasons why certain teams are listed above others <coughs> pardon me but the, the teams that were very successful early on during the Alliance era, 99, 2000, 2001, those, I mean, I was, I was on a team that was very successful. Team 45 was very successful back then. And the reason why our team made it through and was almost, we were almost the first ever repeat champion in 1999 um, was, be, was really because one of our freshman students was, was scouting and he found um, our second pick and and he convinced the rest of us to go watch a match of theirs it was team 84 chuck pie and um I, I don't think that many teams put a lot of investment into scouting back then i think i think it's more of a norm now so maybe it <clears throat> i think the mid mid 2000s that probably changed to be um if you're going to be successful you need to have a really good scouting team i think there's been there used to be scouting alliances. I mean, I remember back in 2003, we were part of a Delphi and GM scouting alliance. And so there's been a lot of efforts to try to try to commonize scouting over the years. But um, yeah, it's always been a good thing. But mid 2000s was when it really took hold, I think. And yeah, that makes a bunch of sense as, you know, teams figured out the, the alliance era um, that we've been in ever since that make that makes a bunch of sense to me yeah. um so this isn't everybody question um but i'm gonna start with amanda um what is your favorite individual robot action things like you know climbing shooting spinning a control panel that kind of stuff mm. um well i i really enjoy anything different that we haven't seen before so i was really excited for spinning of the control panel just because that's a different uh, mechanism than we'd normally see. But second to that, I really like, you know, the flying game pieces. So, you know, the dynamic shooters, the launchers in 2016, where they just like catapulted the mm -hmm. balls into the goal were pretty cool. So anytime you see flying game pieces. What about you, Andy? I, th I think 2012's balancing bridges was just, it was, it was such a cool thing. 
they did it back in 2001, but it wasn't so much with two and three robots. Um, I think the, the, the sheer mass and the, the end game factor of, of the completed balance of the triple balance in 2012 was really a cool action. Makes a bunch of sense. I, I like to relive, you know, <laughs> finals three, um, Archimedes 2012 a lot. That's one of the, like on the short list videos um, that we like to show new students of, this is why FRC is exciting before they get to an actual event. Um, that, that's one of them because the bridge balancing is so dramatic. Um, Okay, this is probably gonna be our final question. Um, and this is an everybody question. Um, start with Andy. What is your favorite robot mechanism of all time? Gosh, favorite robot mechanism. I'm, I'm torn because I've been involved with a few that have been pretty impactful. So I'm kind of selfish here, but... Um, I guess I'm torn between the roller claw and the dog shifter. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with roller claw because that, that was really successful on a few teams I was on. And I think it's it's not really it's not really apparent how it works exactly, even though it's a simple mechanism. The roller claw to grab a ball is my favorite. Makes a bunch of sense. Amanda, what do you think? Um I think I'd have to say any of the buddy climb systems that we've seen really like the cooperation working between robots working together to achieve the, the a common like end game is really exciting. Hmm. Liz, you have one? I don't know about us like a generic mechanism, but I remember I first started on a team in 2004 and I remember being amazed by some of the like reveal videos that teams put out like I remember just wild stangs stare, you know, climbing up that step and their smooth action of just like lifting up and sliding over onto that step was like amazing. And yeah. It was just like, oh my gosh, how did they do that? They um, just raised their whole robot. Right. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So there's like key videos like that if you go back and, and find them in archives um, that were just like crazy to watch. Right. What, do you, what about you? I, I have a lot of pretty good answers, mm -hmm. but I think mine is, mine's gotta be the advent of the kit of parts chassis being in the kit. Um, it basically, it's not like it's a new you know, mechanism per se, but it's a new, at the time it was new to give a, here is a good solution to help play the game back in 2005 um, with this thing that's actually designed for FRC robots. It wasn't like a collection of parts that maybe work together and you know, here's some sort of instructions. Like it was like, here's your drivetrain in a box. You can now move. Um, I like it because it was so impactful that, I mean, we still have, have a, a good drivetrain in the kit to this day. Um, and we almost take movement for granted, but, but back then like movement was in itself a challenge. And I like that, like that became a thing and people have eventually come to like it. Um, it was controversial back then, right? Like, a, like some people were like, no, it's, Part of the challenge would be making your own sprockets kind of kind of thing and like some people enjoy that part of frc like they they enjoy the experience of you know leading students through you know hand making gear sprockets wheels whatever because they, you know they find value in teaching the skills needed for that and that's that's fine um but i i just, I just like that you know that one simple move of give you a drivetrain raise the floor a lot um which is a kind of a different answer mm -hmm. i think um so it, it is nine o'clock there's a ton of really good questions in here but we did promise um, our guests to have strict uh, sleeping schedules that we wouldn't keep them too long here. Um, but definitely want to thank both of you for taking the time, both you know for our um, main content session, but also coming back for our Q and A today and kind of saying hello to chat and live in real time. But uh, also on behalf of our behind the scenes crew, Brad Thompson, who stitched all that wonderful video together and is making us you know appear to you. Um, and also want to say happy birthday to Matt Malinak, who directed this whole show. Today's his birthday. I want to wish him a very happy, happy birthday. Um, you know, he's working on his birthday. What a guy, right? Um, but thanks to him for roping us all together, together and um, making this happen. Um, so um, that's it for uh, session number two. Our next session is actually going to be on the opposite days uh, that we were this week. We're actually going to be Monday um, is our next session at 7 p.m., which will be session number three. Um, where we're going to cover some games that might be a little more familiar to some of the people watching, um, be games from 2009 to 2013. 
Um, I'm really kind of excited for that era because it's like right at the end of my high school career and the beginning of my mentoring career. Um, I had a lot of good memories from those games. So I'm excited for that episode. We're going to have um, two like real, really master strategists and alumni on that show. We're going to have uh, Katie Wyden uh, and Peyton Young, uh, people that we know pretty well. Um, really, really excited for, for episode three. But um, again, thanks to Chad as well for tuning in, sticking around for our Q&A show. And um, we will see you on Monday. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.